Hello everybody and welcome back to Shea Moda Media. I am your host, Aiden Watcher, and here are your cars for today. A 1990 Nissan Skyline R31 wagon. A 1981 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. <laughs> a not-so-stock 2006 Dodge Magnum SRT8. A 1991 Mitsubishi... Oh my god, Mitsubishi... A 1991 Mitsubishi 3000 GTSL and its redneck cousin. And the 2001 Plymouth Prowler. For the 1990 Nissan Skyline R31 wagon, we're heading to the land down under. Crikey. Shrimp on that baby! <laughs> When we talk about the Nissan Skyline, we're not exactly picturing a family-sized wagon, but Australia had uh, some different ideas. The Nissan Skyline wagon was offered in Australia between 1986 and 1990. In 1986, they were offered with a 3-liter engine with 183 foot-pounds of torque, 153 horsepower, and a top speed of 121 miles per hour. With a total weight of 2,998 pounds, the 0 to 60 for this bad boy was 8.6 seconds. And this vehicle really didn't change much until about 1990. God, the overall design of this car just looks sad. <laughs> In 1990, the car still borrowed a lot of parts from the Nissan Pinatara. Pinatara? Pintara. Pantera? And offered in the 3 liter fuel injected V6, which also was in the Holden VL Commodore. That engine was the RB30. RB Power! <laughs> The RB30ET Turbo, offered in single overhead cam and dual overhead cam as well, busting out about 101 horsepower and a 118 foot pounds of torque. I have to put my camera here because there's a butt. <laughs> now, to be honest, I couldn't find any advertisements for this car and not a lot of information for this vehicle as well. However, it's still fucking cool. Now, the 1990 Nissan Skyline R31 wagon that we're gonna be talking about is far from stock. This is Ben's 1990 Nissan Skyline R31 wagon. Oh, fuck, that thing's so fucking cool. This car is both used, abused, and loved. Mostly abused. Now, between having it as a weekend cruiser and a track car, uh, having 1.5 inches of clearance is not that much. <laughs> Dude, those 15-inch Advan wheels fit this car so fucking well. Jesus Christ. The stance on this car is absolutely fucking beautiful, and the fact that you borrowed uh, S13 steering is uh, <laughs> sweet. I see your bribe seats in there. I see them in there, those little buggies. You got your buggy seats for your wagon? <laughs> you got buggy seats because you go so fast? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately for Ben, some of the modifications that he did make for his car are not eligible to keep it on the road. He did say if I did pick his car, it would give him the motivation to actually get this car back to being roadworthy and. Ben, come on, you gotta do it, dude. This thing's fucking sweet. Now, I usually review cars on this channel and not toasters, but however, this 1990 Nissan R31 wagon is cool. It's giving Torino vibes, to be honest, but the rarity of this car is bumping up the numbers, but the overall condition is bringing it down. I'm gonna graciously give you a seven and a half out of 10 Thank you. in hopes that you do get this thing back to being roadworthy and back on the track on the occasion. <laughs> My cup screen. <laughs> A name that I feel like we don't hear often anymore is Oldsmobile. Only because they had some very interesting eras, but yeah, we're not gonna talk about it. We are gonna actually talk about it. If we're talking about Cutlass Supremes, we're taking it back to 1966. Much of it in new Oldsmobiles. Here's one of my favorites. Oldsmobile's new Cutlass Supreme four-door hardtop. The year is 1996 and power to weight ratio is out the fucking window. The Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme had a Supreme reign from 1966 to 1997. How Supreme? The first generation Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme was offered from 1906 to 1977 in the two-door yellow above me and the four-door behind my fat fucking head. I, I'm still in the fucking way. There it is! In 1996, in 1996, in 1966, the Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme offered the 4.4 liter, 330 cubic inch Jetfire rocket engine. This V8 pushed out a whopping 320 horsepower. However, in 1967, it offered the 442, the 400 cubic inch engine. 
As we move into 1968, we were offered the second generation of the Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. It got its iconic split grille, a shortened body, and that rocket engine went from 330 cubic inches to 350, beefing up the horsepower to 310. Oh my god, you're so sexy. In 1970, it's time for the dual gate. English is my first language, I promise. In 1970, it's time for the Hearst dual gate shifter. We also got the Code Y29 High Performance SX, which was equipped with a larger jet fire engine, which was earlier 350 cubic inches, now 455. Uh, I would give my left testicle for one of these cars. When we talk about the 442, we also have to talk about Hearst. Hearst was founded in 1958 by George Hearst and Bill Campbell, and later ended in 1970. They, uh, uh, <coughs> and they manufactured aftermarket manual transmissions. And as another fun fact, Hearst actually developed the Jaws of Life. So essentially the same company that drives your car could save you from said car. Cool! And for those of you who don't know, 442 stands for four barrel carbureted, four speed dual exhaust. Now I'm gonna do myself a favor and not make this video three hours long by explaining to you how many models and how, <laughs> how many models of the Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme are, and we're just gonna fast forward to 1981. Wait till you see my new car, the luxurious 1981 Farrington. Nancy, that's the 81 Cutlass Supreme Brome. Oh sure, Oldsmobile had it built, but it's me, elegant, gorgeous inside, stylish outside, and a standard V6 for good mileage. Who says luxury has to cost a mint? We've had one built for you. Farrington. Cutlass Supreme Brome. Oldsmobile. Now nothing screams I smoke with the kids in the car than a 1981 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. <laughs> I'm like 95% sure I've inhaled secondhand smoke in one of these things. <laughs> it says ass supreme. <laughs> Unfortunately, I fast forwarded too much and the Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme took a high dose of power loss. In 1981, it got a 4.3 liter V8 pushing out 100 and Five, oh my God, 105 horsepower and 193 foot pounds of torque. With an overall weight of 3,290 pounds, it had a zero to 60 in 15.8 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> that is the literal definition of zero to 60 in three to five business days. And at a top speed of 101 miles per hour. Now that 4.3 liter was the Rochester M2MC, 260 cubic inch, two barrel carb. It was also offered a 3.8 liter V6, a 4.4 liter V8, and a 5.7 liter V8 diesel. But we're talking about the four liter V8 here. Yeah, damn, ain't she pretty? This is Sam's 1981 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme, and my God, is it pretty. These 1980 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supremes have this iconic shovel front end for aerodynamics, and I just think it's the absolute coolest. Because when you're not plowing into the back of somebody else's car, you could plow your driveway. Now to keep up with modern highways, Sam did have to beef this bad boy up to about 350 horsepower in order to keep up, via getting it completely retuned and having forged internals. Now we did say that it is a super rare variant of this car, and everybody says they have a super rare, super rare, super rare variant of the car. But it does have the aluminum hearse rims down here, and they are technically rare. Now I will say that the very cool thing about this car is a lot of this is still original, including the paint and. I don't know about you, but I can't see a single swirl in that black paint. Fucking man. <laughs> Damn boy, she's slicker than grease. I can imagine myself as a raindrop and just coming down and whoop. <laughs> nah, man, this thing's fucking cool. I do like G bodies. There's only a handful of G bodies that I do like. Oldsmobile being one of them, Buick Regal being the other. And I'm not gonna lie, when I was skimming through all the photos of what you guys have sent me, I thought this was the Buick Regal, so. Did I pick this car by accident? I don't know. <laughs> you know what, man? Somebody needs to love this car, and clearly you do. Uh, if I gotta rate this thing, dude, I'm not gonna lie. 10 out of 10. 10 out of absolute 10. This thing is so incredibly clean and immaculate. And that's something that I... I don't care if it's a Dodge Dakota that you've kept in the garage for 15 years. If it's clean, it's clean, and there's no doubt about it. Now with close to 190,000 models of this ever being made, I'm not doubting the rareness. I just think the wheels are more rare than the actual car itself. But still, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, it's good. Hooray! Do the little fucking, bah, uh, mac not Macarena. What's the, con oh, confetti, bah, confetti. 10 out of 10. <laughs> 
We're moving on to a car that really doesn't need an introduction because the SRT8 uh, speaks for itself. But we're not gonna talk about the SRT8 yet because we gotta go back to the beginning of the Dodge Magnum. You are looking at a magic means of transportation. New Dodge Magnum XE, a splendid combination of touring car and luxury car. Consider Magnum XE's exciting update of the classic cord type grill. Inside, a place of sophisticated instrumentation, electronic wizardry, snug, crafted, comfortable. See the new Dodge Magnum XE, a magic means of transportation. This beefcake is the 1978 Dodge Magnum, and yes, it doesn't look like what you think a Magnum would look like. Now, this this car has like a kind of like a hiccup in history because it's sold in America for a little bit of time, then Brazil, then Mexico, then back to the United States. But it ran from 1978 to 1979. But the Dodge Magnum here lasted from 1978 to 1979. But in 1978, this car was going to become more than just a coupe. Faster than fast, quicker than quick. I am speed. Around here, it's always bumper to bumper. I gotta concentrate full time on my driving, so I use the racing version of the STP double oil filter. See, in 1978, Richard Petty was running into an issue. The 74 charge that he was using for NASCAR was becoming ineligible for NASCAR. So technically, the 78 Dodge Magnum was created to keep Richard Petty racing with most to keep him racing with Mopar. Now I'll tell you what, that's one good looking race car right there. And this would be the 78 Dodge Magnum that he would be using for NASCAR. I mean, between the 74 Charger and this, I personally don't see any better aerodynamics. I guess this thing's just less of a brick. Now the King and his team got this Dodge Magnum running to about 190 miles per hour. However, at 190, Richard Petty did say that this car was incredibly unstable which may have led to a few accidents. But from 79 to 81, the Dodge Magnum was offered in Brazil as this beauty. And then in Mexico from 1981 to 1988. Oh God. But in 1988, the Dodge Magnum flatlined, only to be revived in 2005 on the XL, no, the LX platform. Play the commercial. Thing. I got an amp, guitar, surfboard, ladder, and 12 2 by 4s Velocity meets versatility. The all-new Hemi-powered Dodge Magnum. Open it up from either end. Getting resuscitated, resuscitated in 2004 for the 2005 year. Now in 2005, it was released with, and yes, I'm using my notes, a 2.7 liter 190 horsepower V6, the 3.5 liter 250 horsepower V6, and the RT featuring the 340 5.7 Hemi, baby. That's right, I said a Hemi. We're not talking about those bozos, we're talking about this bozo. Debuting in the 2005 Los Angeles Auto Show was the SRT8, sporting the 6.1 liter 425 horsepower V8 engine. It also borrowed the Mercedes five speed, but we won't tell you that. And did win the best new muscle car by Motor Trend. Coming in at almost two metric tons, zero to 60 was actually 5.1 seconds, which is nuts for a car like this. It's time to throw the book away, not physically because I would hit my green screen, uh, but we're gonna talk about front end swaps, baby. Cool thing about the Dodge Magnet is somewhere along the lines, you guys thought, hey, the front end is ugly, let's swap it with literally anything else. Perhaps the Challenger SRT, not your taste. Perhaps the gross looking 300 front end for whatever reason. Actually, this one's not that bad. Yeah, I'm using Google search, get off my back. But if none of these are your speed, hopefully this one is. Holy frijoles! I don't even know what that means. I think it's like holy Fritos or something. This is my buddy Kyle's 2006 Dodge Magnum SRT, SRT Charger front swapped. <laughs> this thing's so fucking cool, dude. Now it did start off as your simple 2006 Dodge Magnum SRT8 with the 20 inch wheels, the Brembo brakes, yada, yada, yada. But with a whole lot of elbow grease and body alignment, he created the masterpiece. Oh, adding angelic sounds to make it holy. I might cream. Oh, 
my god, it gets so much better. With the Vortec V3 supercharger pushing in about 10 to 13 PSI, this car makes around 600 horsepower. Oh my god. But you know what? Let's listen to it, shall we? Prepare your ear holes. Now, even though this is my friend's car, I'm not gonna be biased on this vehicle. But it's still getting a fucking 10 out of 10. <laughs> you know how much I love wagons and this just puts a combination of power and wagon and power wagon. This car is an absolute work of art and I really can't say anything bad about this vehicle. This is technically everything Chrysler should have done but hasn't done and will not do. However, if you really take a look at it, this is just a flattened Dodge Durango SRT8. Or SRT, excuse me. Now, but really, like, take a look at a Dodge Durango and just squish it, and it's essentially this. Oh well, still 10 out of 10 for me. Fucking bah, 10 out of 10, bah, 10 out of 10, baby. Moving on. Moving on to a 1991 Mitsubishi. 3000 GT, baby. Millions of years ago, Nature created a vehicle that accelerates, steers, and stops with all fours. That ingenious concept has now been engineered into a car. Introducing the Mitsubishi 3000 GT. With all-wheel drive, all-wheel steering, all-wheel anti-lock brakes, and 300 horsepower instead of just one. Don't Mitsubishi, squash the horse. The word is getting around. The year is 1990 and Mitsubishi and Chrysler are up to no good. The Mitsubishi, the, Mit, the, 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 the Mitsubishi 3000 GT ran from 1990 to 2000, while the Dodge Stealth ran from 1991 to 1999. There was no difference between these cars in the early stages, except for the interior. Dodge just had their own idea, like, we're gonna make the interior slightly more mediocre. Now, the 3000 GT and the Dodge Stealth were all equipped with a 3 liter V6. The 3 liter V6 single overhead, the 3 liter V6 dual overhead, and the single, and the, uh, and the 3 liter <laughs> dual overhead twin turbocharged V6. The Series 1 was also dubbed the Z16A. It was offered from 1990 to 1993. It was equipped with four wheel drive and four wheel steering offered by Mitsubishi Motors, also known as the AWC, which was essentially just Mitsubishi's version of all wheel drive. Now, although the Dodge Stealth and the 3000 GT shared a lot of similarities, the base models, however, didn't share the same engine. The base model Dodge Stealth got the 3 liter single overhead pushing 164 horsepower. The beautiful 3000 GT got the dual overhead 3 liter pushing 222 horsepower. Oh my god, it's so nice. The Series 2 came from 1994 to 1997, and there was like a pre and post facelift for these things. And oh! Don't change anything, it looks so nice. <laughs> so in 1995, we did get a few extra models of the 3000 GT, like the 3000 GT Spider, SL, and the VR4. There we go, I had to you know, dig that one out of the memory box. Both were equipped with a retractable hardtop roof, as well as a power boost to 350 horsepower. Tragedy came from 1997 to 2000, where the Dodge Stealth was discontinued. Yes. But unfortunately, the 3000 GT sales plummeted so much that it really didn't get the full facelift that it was supposed to get. Instead, it got a minor lift and a cool little rear spoiler. But unfortunately, in the year 2000, the 3000 GT would follow its cousin into the grave and forever be lost. But let's talk about one that's still alive, shall we? Lord, have the mercy. This is Luke's 1991 Mitsubishi 3000 GT SL. <laughs> God, this thing's fucking mint, dude. Right off the bat, it's the paint job. You'll have to see, hold on, let me change. <laughs> That's cool. It's like a, it's like a wine, you know, like a burgundy, like a wine burgundy. I'm Ron Burgundy and fuck you, San Diego. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get a whole lot of information for this vehicle besides that it does have like a newer interior, better gauges, it's on lowering coils. But all in all, dude, this car is fucking man. I love this thing. Front wheel drive too. So no slip and slides in the rain. Realistically, I would hate to have this car only because people are like, is it a Dodge Stealth? Like, no. Jump off a bridge! Don't do that. Don't jump off a bridge. From the outside, this car is gonna get like a... Oh, God, like a... Mm, clay bar it. Get rid of the swirls. 
and you'll get an eight and a half out of 10. Wheels are not that bad, man. I like the black. I would switch to maybe something else, but that's just me. That's a personal opinion. Okay, we get it. You like flock interior. It's actually pretty cool. I like that. That's mid, dude. I like that. Hold on. I think a hard look. What do you have, a dog? What is this? How much hair is in here? Hopefully not pubes. <laughs> what is it? Uh, NRG. I've never heard of NRG before. That's cool. Oh, you got the steering wheel. It goes ding. Love that. <laughs> hey, the seats look upgraded too. Let me see those. Hopefully it's not, it's not just covers. No, he's got new seats in that bad boy. What is that? No! So much cock! <laughs> Why is there so much cock? Oh my God, what the fuck? Oh, put the bottom, put the panel back. Oh, I don't want to see your cock. Holy shit, dude. Honestly, no, it's getting an eight out of 10. Play bar it, polish it, eight and a half out of 10. Congratulations, man, this car's wicked. Moving on, we're going to be talking about the cilantro of cars. That is the Plymouth Prowler. It's cilantro because either you like it or you don't. There's like no middle ground. Yeah, seven. It started with a childhood memory. Well, it's got to be part retro. Part modern. We got to be nuts. And at the Chrysler Corporation, it grew into an idea for a car so outrageous. We just had to build it. Well, it's not exactly for everyone, is it? That's kind of the point. It's how we do things at the Chrysler Corporation. It's how we build great cars and great trucks. That's right. We're talking about Chrysler's biggest attempt to make an old car look new, the Plymouth Prowler. Plymouth Prowler ran from 1997 to 2002, and only just over 11,000 of these cars were ever actually made. It started with Thomas Gale, who had a love for 30s era's hot rods and Ford Coupes. And with a little bit of help from Chip Foose, Chrysler wanted a follow-up car to their astounding, show-stopping Dodge Viper in hopes to leave car enthusiast Jaws on the showroom floor. This has just got to be one of my favorite photos for Plymouth ever because one of these things is not like the other and it's that fucking thing right there. <laughs> It was definitely a unique car in Plymouth's lineup uh, compared to all of the modernized vehicles that it was pushing out at the time. In 1997, it was equipped with the 3.5 liter 24 valve single overhead cam V6 engine, pushing out a whopping 214 horsepower. But in 1999, it would receive a much needed upgrade with an aluminum block pushing it to 253 horsepower, beating out Chrysler's Magnum V8s at the time. Now there's a weird fine line between the 2000 and 2001 Plymouth Prowler when the Plymouth name was dropped and Chrysler blah, 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 Chrysler decided to pick it up again and call it the Chrysler Prowler. Chrysler Prowler. <laughs> but would still use the Plymouth name here and there, especially in Canada where the last Plymouth was ever sold. Also, this is just pretty cool. For an extra $5,000 when you bought this thing, you can get a little mini trailer that came with it. <laughs> That's fucking cool. Come on. With a combination of a near 50-50 weight distribution and an overall weight of 2,800 pounds, it really allowed the 3.5 liter engine to really run. The first batch of Prowlers only produced 457 of them, which had a zero to 60 of 7.2 seconds. Anything after 1999 with the aluminum block had a zero to 60 of 5.9 seconds and a top speed of 126. Now I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is, is I really wanted to talk about this car because it is cool. It was, an, it, was a, it was trying to do something that a lot of car companies are still trying to do and bring back a classic look to a modern age. And they kind of did so with uh, some yield. The bad news is the guy who sent in their car only has one photo. So I guess, ta-da. This is Caleb's grandfather's 2001 Plymouth Prowler. And there's really nothing special about this bad boy other than he did take the two front bumpers off, which I do think sleeks out the car a little bit more, but I feel like something's missing. Now, unlike Cilantro, which I really love, I don't like these cars. <laughs> there's a lot of other roadsters or sportsters that I would take over this car, but it's still pretty cool, man. I'm not gonna lie. Overall, six out of 10, sorry. I'm realizing as these videos come along, I'm really not ending these with a high note. I'm usually ending them with really bad review cars. <laughs> but overall, I hope you had as much fun as I did today. Thank you so much for those who submitted their cars and were handpicked for today's videos. And thank you to everyone who sends in their cars to be rated. If you didn't see your car in today's video, fucking cry about it. I'm just kidding. Don't be upset. Your car is just not good enough.
these videos are for you as much as they are for me. I pick these cars because they're cars that I want to learn about and they're also cars that I want to educate you guys about as well. But if you want to see your car in a Shea Moto Media video, <laughs> if you want the chance to see your car reviewed on the Shea Moto Media channel, scan the QR code at the end of the video and send in your build. Check me out on TikTok where every Tuesdays and Thursdays I'm trying to get better at that. I do quick five minute reviews on the cars that you guys do send me. But as always, thank you so much for joining me on Shea Moto Media channel. Remember to check your blinking fluid and stay between the lines. Bye.